Greetings, friends. You know, sometimes you come to church, and man, it's really like church. You know what I mean? The music is good. You feel the spirit in place. I know all those words. You know, I wanted to sing those songs. I just wanted to just belt it out, but you know what? I knew I had to get up and preach. And tomorrow. But man, those songs all stir the heart, you know, the words and the melodies, they, they stir us and they welcome us into a time of worship, a time where we can settle our hearts for the purpose of being in the presence of God. Let the Spirit come in our midst, in our community. Let us feel the friendly vibes that we know that are in this place, right? We know that people here care about us, even if they don't know a lot about each one of us individually necessarily. They kind of know who we are because they see us every week or every other week every third week or they see us but they kind of we look vaguely enough familiar where they think there was a church okay that works but the thing of it is is that we feel comfortable in this place and we feel comfortable here because we come here in the name of Jesus we come here for the purpose of meeting Jesus we come here to pray to Jesus we come here to sing praise to Jesus and we come to hear a word so in a little bit somebody's gonna come in and talk to you no we're here to hear a word about Jesus too. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, it said, they met and they listened to the apostles' teaching and they fellowshiped. And then they prayed and then they broke bread together. Four separate things that they did. Now, we don't have the apostles to come teach us anymore. You all have to make do with me. And I'm glad you keep remitting the checks. But you, we, we hear to hear the, the, the apostles' teachings now are in Scripture, right? The gospel messages, those are the apostles we're talking about. We're here. That's why I always try to preach from the gospel. Every once in a while I get to one of the epistles, and, and I've been asked to do that, and we will. But mostly it's the gospel message because those are the ones we want to hear from, right? The ones that's closest to Jesus. I want to hear firsthand what was going on. Well, as close to it as possible. And so what we're supposed to be doing is hearing the teaching and fellowshipping. And the fellowshipping about now, in light of our Wesleyan and Methodist heritage, we got to get it out in the open here that for us, fellowship means something. And for us, fellowship means when three or more of us get together, a chicken must die. We got to fry some chicken. We got to eat. Y'all bring, you bring your good thing and you bring the dessert. We're getting together for fellowship. We're having food. That's what we understand fellowship to be. Let's just get it out there on the table. But that wasn't exactly biblical because it's mentioned two things down that, and they broke bread together, so they're going to eat. Now, it's a different kind of fellowship. It was the kind of fellowship where they talked about what they just heard. They talked about what they heard him say. Y'all ever compare notes on what I say? Do y'all even listen to what I say? It's okay, as long as you keep writing the checks. I'm like, <laughs> wow, okay. But the thing of it is, for us, to really, for us to really understand what the story's trying to tell us and how we're supposed to understand what the words mean when we listen to the apostles' teaching, when I read from you out of the gospel and I try to explain it to you, every one of you hears something slightly different. Every one of you. Here's something slightly different. And for that, I'm grateful because, man, wouldn't the message be boring if y'all heard exactly the same thing? I find comfort in that. You should too, though. Because what that means is each one of you gets a specialized message. See, God has tuned each one. Remember the few weeks ago we talked about the boxes, right? Talked about the boxes. that Remember Nicodemus could only see rebirth through a narrow lens, his paradigm. Then the Pharisees, they had a little bigger one, but it wasn't much. And the, the other religious leaders, Holy Spirit trying to open our minds to a greater understanding because the kingdom of God is bigger than our finite understanding. That's the whole point. And here we are, each of us with our own paradigm, hearing the gospel message as it's going by as the preacher's preacher is being read or wherever you're getting your Bible or messaging from. And some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. But you know, if we're not sharing it amongst each other, then we're, that's, that's the only way we get the whole picture, friends. 
It wasn't just one on one. It was one on 12. Jesus showed 12 because he knew 11 of them at any given time. The subject's not member diddly. So he had a backup for the first 11. That might have been how he got the 12. I don't know. It probably more had to do with the tribes of Israel than anything else. But anyway, the point is, is that it takes all of us to remember. Test. In 2023, we had a word we used all year long. Ended every service with it. Y'all remember what that word was? Emmanuel. And you know what we said about that? God was with us. So every day when we left here, and after every worship service, when we left the worship space, we knew the last words we were said were, Emmanuel, God is with us. And we went, knowing God was with us, whichever door you went out of. Do you remember what the word is for this year? I just said it. Remember. Remember was how we started this year. Okay, my bad. I'm fixing to hammer y'all with some remember. You remember, you remembered Emmanuel. But remember was about us remembering all the covenants of the Old Testament and the final covenant, the blood of the new covenant that Jesus did for us. And that's what we're supposed to be remembering is how did it get from all of God's covenants and promises to the Old Testament to Jesus being the fulfillment of the new covenant and then 2,000 years to today? And why does it matter to us? These are the things that we're having to process. This is, these are the things that are affecting our paradigm. So we don't always see it or get it. So we keep coming to church hoping to get a little more. And I hope to not confuse you any more than I already do and to occasionally bring a, a wee bit of clarity to, to something that we talk about. And so I know that more of you went home this week and pulled out your Bible and read Mark. Don't know how many more, but I'm willing to bet there were some more. And I'll bet there'll be even some more next week. Because, see, we're going to be in this for a few weeks here. And, again, this is not only, this, I told you all this is the shortest gospel. So that's, that's the good part. The second part is this is the one that's most action-packed. There's something happening like all the time. Bam, one thing to another. That's how you get it all in fewer chapters, okay? Leaves a lot of the fluff out and goes straight to the meat of the matter. And so you're going to get that in John, too. I mean, in Mark. All right? So uh, there's a lot of incentive to read this. Plus, you can kind of get a feel for where we're at in the story as, as we get there. Even if you read ahead, that's all good and fine. Just make sure you come back to where we're at. And we're still in chapter 4. And by now, Jesus is, it begins with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how it begins. It launches right into the gospel, the good news. And by the end of chapter 2, Jesus has already got the religious authorities after him. And in chapter 3, he's already doing parables and miracles. And here we're in chapter 4. And, you know, chapter 4 started with the sower and the seed. We didn't cover that this year, but we have before. We didn't cover it right now. The sower and the seed and all the different relations back and forth with his people about what did it really mean. And he tells his disciples, and he goes on, he tells his disciples, he goes on to say that he never told them anything then without telling them in a parable, but he always made sure his disciples knew what it meant. That's the last thing he told us last week. For those of y'all that can do uh, uh, TiVo, and you can like stop and then leave church and come back seven and a half days, six and a half days later or whatever, and hit play and pick up right where we left off, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're TiVo in this. We went from last week where he ended about his, his disciples were always told what the parables mean. Now we're going right into the story yet again. We're going to pick up at chapter 4, verse 35. And you remember, they, he made sure they knew, right? So be clear, you understand where we're going when we read this. They've been hearing all these parables. They've been seeing these miracles. It's recent. Two chapters. It's recent. And Jesus started telling these funny stories. They sort of made sense, and they kind of didn't make sense. And what's a Jewish carpenter? A carpenter, for God's sake, has got anything to do with planting seeds, birds, and stony paths? And what's he got to do with any of that? Everybody knows carpenters don't know diddly about growing food. That's why they build stuff. And he's telling parables. And then he goes on to explain, oh, I've been talking that way on purpose. 
And here's what it means. And the fact that it keeps coming back and telling us, it keeps coming back and telling us what they mean. What all these stories mean. Y'all got that, right? So far, every story we've kind of got, it's clear as mud. I understand as well as you do. But now, now, I don't know about y'all, but this has been a trying time. We've been busy. We've been busy here in Capernaum. I mean, in and out of the house, in and out of the synagogue, up and down the road, on the boat, out of the water, and back of the boat, and on land, visiting with all the people. Oh, my God, they're wearing me out. Jesus needs a break. Jesus needs a break. In true Jesus fashion, he does this five times in the book of Mark. Hey, fellas, let's get out the boats and let's go to the other side. And that's what they're going to do. But now, we talked about this before a little bit, so just by way of refresher, because we don't remember. There's a couple unique geographic features on the northern end of uh, the Sea of Galilee. There's two big valleys that start out wide, and they go deep, and they become narrow, kind of like a funnel. And so when the wind comes off the Mediterranean Sea blowing eastward, okay, it's coming across the little straight there of Israel, and it goes down. The Sea of Galilee is 652 feet. It's just below sea level. The sea is higher. So this wind comes down across ground, unimpeded, goes down into these valleys and accelerates and goes out across the water. Now, fortunately, it's not a daily occurrence, but it happens often enough. A lot of fishermen fish at night. Any fishermen attest to that? Okay. So, it wasn't unusual to be out there on the lake during the cooling periods where the wind's coming, it's cool, so the air's hidden more dense on the bottom. It comes down, it can cause storms. And these are called migales. Migales. And it's the, the last four letters of that are G-A-L-E. Gale. It's where we get our phraseology from for a gale, a blow, a storm. Migale, that's where it's coming from. And they're going to go for a little ride across the lake. So let's just see what happens. See if they run into a Magali or not. Verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, Magali, came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. Okay. Now, these boats. You know, they found one a few decades back. They had a particular drought over there, and one apparently sunk in some shallow water, and because of the receding shoreline, they found it down there in the muck and the mire, excavated it to a museum somewhere. But we got the dimensions. And these boats are like 27 feet long. It was typical. There was, there was uh, uh, stuff in it, pots and coins and this and that that dated it right to, right to the first century, right to the mid, middle part of the first century, so maybe 50 A.D. There was stuff in there that indicated right around that time. So common boat, 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and a little over four feet deep. Okay. What else? Why is that right there or something? 27 feet. They say these things to a crew of five. One person running the tiller and two other uh, uh, for two sets of rowers. Four people to row it. Now it could be powered by sail too if you go in the right direction. But it could haul up to ten more people or about a thousand pounds worth of stuff. Fish. Whatever. But they had ballast in these boats to keep them from just kind of wallowing all around. And in the front of it, they had about a 50-pound cushion. 
It'd be a giant, heavy, like pillow, sort of like a, a bean bag, only filled with sand instead of those little styrofoam pillows. So this bad boy would be heavy up in the front of the ship. And there was a one twice that size, about 100 pounds, in the back. That's how they kept the weight in the proper place on the boat. So people getting out, it could be steady and all this, and that was ballast. Okay? And, it was, and, and, and over the, the front and the back, they had covers over those things. And so there would be a little alcove, a little scuddy hole or something up in there underneath these little things on the front and the back of the boat. Jesus was apparently in the one on the back. Up underneath the ledge where the, the, the person around the tiller would have been sitting, up under his feet, back underneath there, it's like one of those little things on those little campers that go over the top of pickup trucks. It's, you know, if you lay up in that thing, the, the roof is like right here, and you're going like, I ain't sleeping in this. You know what I'm talking about? It's something sort of like that. Jesus was kind of up inside this thing. He's just looking. And a Magale come. Water's pouring in. Now, freeze frame. They wake up Jesus. Now, this isn't the only place this story appears. Besides on random Saturday morning cartoons, it also appears in Luke and Matthew. Okay? And in those stories, it's very different. In Matthew, Jesus, save us. Jesus, save us. Okay. And in Luke, they just tell Jesus, all matter of factly, we're going to die. We're going to die. That's it. We're just going to die. Don't say, Jesus, help us. Don't save us. None. We're just going to die. That's what they say in Luke. But in Mark, they're a little more passionate about it. They're downright indignant. I mean, Jesus, don't you even care if we're going to drown? I mean, that's what they're saying. To Jesus. He's asleep back in the little space there. Calm as he can be. Storm's coming. Water's coming in. Water's coming in the boat. says it's about to get swamped. I didn't make that up. Water's coming in. Apparently, Jesus is high and dry or he don't care. Probably both. They wake him up. Don't you even care that we're going to drown? Not, will you save us? Not, we're going to die. Just, don't you even care? Now, I know that when y'all read your Bibles, you pick up on these little nuances of phrase, these little turns on words that make it mean something different. Jesus, save us. We're going to die. Don't you even care? How cool would it be if we remembered, if we remembered that in Mark, in Mark, they think Jesus don't even care. Don't you even care? When we hear this story, we already know. They think Jesus doesn't care. And so Jesus' response is, is what we really need to hear today, friends. Jesus' response, by the way, the answer is always Jesus, right? Y'all knew that? Okay, anyway. Jesus' response here is the classic. That we need to hear this as often as we need to hear. It's not the only time. A message like this is exposed to us in the New Testament. But for some reason, we don't seem to imbibe this in such a way that it becomes a part of who we are. I mean, we, you know, we tattoo stuff on, we put stickers on, we sew it on it, we do all kinds of ways to attach stuff to us. But for some reason, this part doesn't seem to attach. And Jesus says, I want to make sure I get this exactly right because I don't want to misquote Jesus. I mean, that's... Not cool. Um, he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Because see, their, don't you even care, was actually a mask for their terror. Because they were terrified of the storm. They're terrified of everything. Oh, and then Jesus just getting up going, quiet, be still, Psst. Okay, we were kind of hoping for a little help here, Jesus, but wow, wow. So now they're really scared. I mean, y'all have those moments? You know, when you're going through life, just being normal, typical, 
you know, monsoon, hurricane, thunderstorm, tornado coming down the street, and all of a sudden you say, oh, Jesus, please save us, and whoosh. Oh, well, that was cool. And you're just going about your business. Or do you stop and go, whoa. Do some form of a freak out. I mean, whatever your relative form is. But you freak out in line with who you are. And you go run and tell somebody. You know, you're not going to believe this, but you won't believe what God just did. Do you all expect to have moments like that? Or do you fear, fear moments like, because see, we're talking about that here too. The disciples were terrified by what Jesus did, calming the storm and all, the power that was present and necessary to change a squall, a gale to calm seas. The power it takes to do that was unmistakable in them. They were terrified that they were in the presence of that kind of power. And at the same time, a different kind of scare, a different kind of afraid. What does that mean now? What does that mean? You ever thought about that? They witnessed the magic of the miracle, common of the seas, okay. And now they're experiencing the, now what? And the reason why that is so poignant in this particular case, because I need to remind you, they're out in the middle of a lake, in a boat, with this guy that's got this power. That's no MT moment, friends. That's the stuff you see on the memes. Oh, my gosh. Does that really mean what I think it means? Dude's got this power, and we're stuck in the boat with him. How deep is it right here? I don't know how far is land. I don't know. We're stuck. Y'all kind of get the drift here now? It's one thing for y'all to hear a word in church, on TV, on your phone. You can turn stuff off and walk away. But if you're in a boat, on a lake, stuck with Jesus, you ain't getting away. And that is more true about our circumstance than we ever give credit. Y'all realize that, right? We are never not in a boat with Jesus. Emmanuel was very timely in 23, but it's timely today, too. So we do well to remember the tie-in with that. You know, some, some things have happened this week. You know, Jesus says, why are you so afraid? And the people's reaction was because they were around all the, of Jesus and what had just happened. But you notice, Jesus never said, there's nothing to be afraid of. How many of us, without showing hands, how many of us were raised by a mom or an aunt or a grandmother or somebody says, there's nothing to be afraid of. Fall down, get a boo-boo, be a little scared, whatever. Nothing to be afraid of. Y'all have somebody like that? Not afraid of? Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say there's nothing to be afraid of. He says, why are you so afraid? God's right here with you. He's in the boat. You're not alone. God's here with you. So how many of us heard that first time when Jesus said, why are you so afraid? And he equated it with the same thing that we've come to understand in that general context of, there's nothing to be afraid of. And here's the danger with all that, friends, that association. And we all got it, by the way. It's a fact. They've, they've done countless psychological studies, and for most of us, that those two things are more or less intertwined. There's nothing to be afraid of, and why are you so afraid? And the truth of the matter is we all know that there is stuff to be afraid of, and that's the danger of the two becoming intertwined because there is stuff to be afraid of. So we want to be careful about the phrase, there's nothing to be afraid of. It would be more appropriate at any time. Why are you afraid? Why? Are you afraid? It's much more valid and encouraging than there's nothing to be afraid of. Because see, uh-oh, Sharon, somebody picked up my can. You did. You did. You got my can, didn't you? Where'd you put it? Okay, I knew it was going to happen. Time out.
I had a can. I still do have a can. When my son was uh, between two and three years old, he was a cute little strapper like little kids are. You know, he had his Barney PJs on. He wore his little cowboy boots that he wore 24-7. Well, just except when we bathed him. But anyway, he always had them on in his Barney pajamas, and he had his little bed on the floor. He'd climb in and out of him and stuff. One day, he's screaming in his bedroom. I go running in there. Bad dream. There's monsters in here. What are they at? They're in the closet. How do you know? I saw them. Oh, you did? Yeah. In the closet? Right over here? I went over to open the closet. I don't see anything. He said, he only comes out in the dark. Well, then how'd you see him? Because I could see him in the dark. Okay. About the time Annette comes into the scene, and she's going to rescue me. Along the way, she stopped and picked up a, a can of the trusty Lysol spray. Because you see, aside from the scientific and bacterial and cleaning properties that this product has, it also has something that only spiritually discerning moms would know. It's monster spray. <laughs> and Annette took this stuff, and she walked in the room, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm about to go down this rabbit hole with Cody now, two and a half year old. I'm, I'm already down the path. He's leading me by the hand. I'm in trouble already. And Annette says, don't worry, Cody. I got just what we need. And he says, what? She says, monster spray. And he goes, what? And she says, there, there used to be on the can, there was a picture of a little house. I mean, you could use it all over the house. So she pointed to the picture. She said, you see this picture of the house on here? This picture means it takes care of the monsters in the whole house. <laughs> and so she goes, where are they? And he says, in the closet. She goes, where else? I think under the bed. She said, okay, Psh. anywhere else. And his mind, mind's just working. No, I think that's all. She said, okay, I'm going to leave it right here on his dress because he couldn't reach that high. I'm going to leave it right here, and if I need it, I don't know right where he says, okay. I don't know if she ever had to spray that again or not, maybe once or twice. But we used to leave an empty can of Lysol sitting on top of his dresser for, I don't know, a couple, three years. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. But the point is, his, there's nothing to be afraid of, was real. There was something to be afraid of for him. So it wasn't, let's just tell you, oh, just poo-poo, he's calm. Just calm, relax, breathe deep. And no, let's talk about your fears. Let's and that's what Jesus does for us. Are we afraid of that? Or do we rejoice in that? And we know the obvious answer is to rejoice in it, right? But what's our typical, real world answer? Rats. I know I hate the answer too, friends. You're not the only ones. It means we've got to do something. Because if we've witnessed the power, it's in the boat with us, and we know it's not monster spray, because there really are things to be afraid of. Jesus never tells us not to be afraid. He just says, why are you afraid? And there's something about naming what it is that makes it not so big. All psychologists will tell you that too. And so no matter what it is that you can name, is that bigger than Jesus? That's the real question here, see? The storm, eh, there's no storm too big. Jesus can't calm. No matter how big the storm seems in our life, if we can name it, if, if we got the vastness in our vocabulary that we can name the entire problem that we have, just mine, not yours, just mine, we could start to get a place where we could name it. Maybe Jesus could help us with it. But as long as I leave it nebulous, unnamed, uncategorized, undefined, just kind of, yeah, I got a problem. Yeah, you should have my problems. You know, whatever we do to mask in these particular things, we all do it. And Jesus' question cuts right through that. Why are you afraid? So, friends, this week, we need to understand that faith is. 
That's why that's, that's it, just faith is. Jesus says, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? He didn't say, what, you only got a little bit of faith? Why have you no faith? Zero. Zip. Zilch. You think they had no faith? Do any of us think that sometimes we have no faith? If you can understand that you're in a boat and Jesus is riding with you, storm or no storm, and the power that he represents, and you're afraid, do you have faith or no faith? Pretty simple question. Because it's not a, I need more faith. You know, y- y'all do understand faith is not something you pull up to a gas pump and pull it out and stick it in your tank and I'm just juicing up on faith. You, you know it doesn't work that way. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift by grace that God gives us when we accept Christ. And when you get your faith, it's not a if or a little or my faith is growing. No, I beg to differ. Faith is. It is. If you have faith, you got faith. Now, it doesn't mean you don't trim around and treat it like a little bonsai tree and keep that bad boy all trimmed up all nice and pretty. But that doesn't mean that's all it is. Faith is what allows you to be in a boat with that awesome power and go through your life knowing that no matter what storms come your way, that Jesus is there. And also to know that for now he's with us, but when he's gone, we're going to be on our own. And the paraclete is here with us now, the Holy Spirit. The power is the same. The delivery method's a little different than Jesus in the person. Now we're dealing with the Holy Spirit. But are we prepared for that, or are we afraid of it? Are we afraid like the disciples were afraid? Jesus asked him a faith-based question. Have you no faith? Because a little bit. We just learned that, right? Just a little bit grows a bunch. Faith just is. Jesus is. We're here because we believe that he is who Scripture points to. Are you aware he's in your boat? And are you going to turn to him this week? And are you going to start naming those things that you're afraid of? See, that's going to be the real. Uh, that'll depend on where you're progressing this week. This week when you're back to reading Mark, if you also come to that place where you are willing to name something that you're afraid of that previously you just let kind of float around through your life. You're going to drag it down, flog it on the countertop, stab it with a pen, not your hand, and name it, and then pray over it. What is, what's that going to be? Everybody has something. Might be a health issue. Might be a worry. Might be a concern. Might be a loved one. Might be a grandchild, great-grandchild. It could be one of a million things. But something you have that makes you afraid that you're afraid to name. This week, name it and pray for it. See what God does with it. Start small. God will take you there. But faith, yeah. Faith just is. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.